All right. Hey, guys, I'm Michael Houlihan. I play on the NAS uh, men's ice hockey team, and I'm a sophomore uh, accounting and finance major. Nice, Michael. I am uh, John. I am a sophomore as well, and I am on the men's golf team and the men's soccer team. I am a finance major, wealth management minor, and accounting minor. All right. Hello, everyone. I am Madeline, and I am a biomedical sciences major, also a sophomore. Yeah. All right. Sweet. Um, so the first question I had was, after watching Muhammad Katani's speech, what are some ways you can recognize the power behind the words that you say? One thing that automatically like came to me was sort of the body language of the audience, but especially when you're in a classroom, it's only like 15 to like 25 people. So if you just survey the room, because you're you should be making eye contact with people, you can sort of see the way that they are taking it, especially with like facial expressions, body expressions, and things like that. Um, so I just thought that his words became really powerful when he started telling a story that people could relate to like about with his young child and what words to use against them when they're doing something bad. Um, so that was, it was just easy to relate to. Yeah. So what I got out of it um, was the way he used his pauses. So like last week we talked about that um, when he would pause talking about uh, resuscitating that guy in the hospital, that really like had a lot of power behind it. So I think that maybe me personally, if I used pauses in my speech more and knew when to use them and when they would be the most effective, then I would be able to put more power behind the words that I say. That's a good point. All right, I'll take one of my questions from the reading, the rules of effective language. So they went through like all the 10 rules, but my question to you guys is, which one do you think is the most important to making a great speech? Maddie, you want that? Um, well, I'll go uh, first. I think rule number one really stuck out to me, even though it's the first rule. Um, just keeping it simple. I, I, I find that I lose my attention to somebody if they are rambling on about the same thing over and over again. And I know also in this class, we talk about repetition, but there's a point of repetition and over repetition, I think. So I would say that's my favorite because it, it kind of hammers, hammers home the point that you need to be concise with what you're saying, but also be able to get the point across. Um, I think that the rule that stuck out to me the most was rule number three, credibility is as, as important as philosophy, um, because in the beginning, it just says that the words you, you use become you, and you become the words you use. So I, I think oftentimes, as people are giving a speech, it's easy to like exaggerate the truth or something like that. Um, and that's just something that I think people really needs to take into consideration because your audience really will base what you say, like as you, like who you are, so. Yeah, I agree with both of those. I mean, staying consistent in the speech, just keeping, not keeping the same tone, especially when you're emphasizing different things. That's probably the biggest one, is just to make sure that your tone sure. portrays exactly what you're speaking about. And then also, like Maddie said, relating it back to your audience is also very important. Yeah. Um, so the second question I had was on. Well, Wait, let me let me say one of mine. Oh yeah, go let me say one of mine. Sorry, I thought like, you already went. <laughs> no, it's okay. Okay. Um, in rule number nine, the author says that asking a rhetorical question can have a much greater impact than a statement. Why do you think this is the case? Um, I would say that this is the reason that is is because. If you ask a rhetorical question to, let's say, an audience, um, when you're asking that question, it becomes personal to the person that hears it. So it's not directed towards the whole audience. The, the individual that hears it feels more connected with you because you're asking them that question and it really makes them think about uh, an answer to that question that they may not even know, if that makes sense. That's, that's mm -hmm. kind of what I got out of it. Yeah, because okay, I know I know a lot of people, especially when they get asked normal questions, like a statement question, they're kind of scared that they're going to be wrong. So when you ask a rhetorical question, you're kind of thinking it and like the way that you take it personally. 
so that way everyone's personal opinion will be actually taken into account instead of one person's over everyone else's. Yeah, that's a good point. All right, Michael. Oh, okay. All right. So my second question was on rule number five, uh, novelty, which is offer something new. The text said, uh, words that work often involve a new definition on an old idea. So what I wanted to ask about that is, uh, what are some examples that you see like in everyday life that uh, portray that rule? Well, I mean, like a lot of the times there's like different like old sayings and stuff like that that are kind of like, get, go, like getting passed through with the times. So when there's a new look, like when there's a new view on something, it's, all, it's always a good thing because then people open their eyes to it and they can see it through that aspect instead of being just so one-sided there's so many other ways that you can view a situation for speech yeah i think i just remember in that um rule as they were talking about it they just mentioned that people are always waiting for like the next big thing it's people get sick of hearing the same thing over and over again so whether it's another thing that's related to an old thing they're just waiting to hear something new so uh, I just, I just, the way I would answer that is just bringing in like a real life example as well. Uh, what really sticks out to me with that is like Geico commercials. You always say 15% or more on Geico in 15 minutes or less, but they always find a new way of telling you how to do that with all their commercials. I just think it's a catchy way to catch someone's eye, but it still kind of reminds people, hey, you can still do this with our service. So. I forgot that that was your main question, and I would just like to say that TurboTax is yeah. one that really caught my attention. <laughs> oh, that, that's, that's just what company, I said. That's why companies can do so well now. What was yeah. that? That's, I said that's why I think companies do so well now, because they have that versatility aspect. Yeah, definitely. I think the companies that thrive the most probably uh, repeat what they have to say in a new way. So that's yeah. Why. They still get their message across to new customers and old old customers alike. So, yeah, it just makes things like more exciting, I guess. Definitely, John. Yeah, and so one of the topics that we discussed, I think it was the first week actually of classes, was sort of like the connecting sentence or the connecting words to have in a speech, like and because. Do you, like do you think that those words helped? Um, oh man, I really forgot his name. Mohammed Fatani. Yeah, Mohammed. Do you think it helped out Mohammed's speech and made a bigger impact in the crowd for his audience? Uh, yeah, I think it did because it helped him transition from the different stories that he had. So it was uh, smoother when he went through it instead of him talking and talking and talking about the same thing. He was able to be concise with the stories that he was telling but also move on to make a new point and hammer home his main topic that he was talking about as well. Yeah, I agree with that. Just the fluidity of his whole speech. Like I was never sitting there watching it and feeling awkward or like something didn't flow right. Um, I don't remember like specifically what transition words he would use or if he used because I assume he did, but there was never a moment where I was like feeling like it, nothing, like it wasn't supposed to belong there or something. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I definitely think from his aspect, it makes the story like more personable. Like it's a lot easier for people to understand it. It gets to the point even clearer than without saying because. Yeah. So, yeah. Maddie. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, our particular phrase that stood out to me in Muhammad's speech was anything you utter can be taken as the truth. When I heard this phrase, I thought about rule number three. Credibility is as important as philosophy. What gives someone the motive to say something dishonest? What could happen if you are not honest? Uh, I'd, I'd say the motive behind being dishonest is maybe saving people from the truth. Sometimes a white lie can help somebody out more than telling the truth can. But that kind of goes back to that rule of credibility. You kind of lose it if they find out that you're lying to them. And I think that can leave a bigger impact, even if it's a white lie, like, oh, I can't hang out today with your friend or something that can snowball into something much bigger that you'll have to fix over time and go back and try and fix that later on. So, yeah, I agree with Michael. Like, it's, 
it's a lot better to be an honest person than to be known as a liar because then your credibility is tarnished essentially if you lie because then people will be if you say something people are gonna be like is that a lie because they don't know if it's true or not since you've lied in the past right i feel like people might become disappointed as they find out that something was a lie and you just lose your credibility yeah yeah i agree with that uh, so the third question I had was uh, on rule number one, which is simplicity. We already went over it a little bit. Um, it said the simpler the idea, the more understandable the idea is. Uh, and my question with that is, do you think this rule could potentially have negative effects? I think so, because being too simple on some topics, especially if like it's say it's a TED talk and not many people are familiar with your concepts or what you're talking about. If you're too simple and don't really go into as much explanation, some people will be left with like question marks and questions. Can you read your question again? Uh, do you think this rule could potentially have negative effects? What was the rule? Uh, the rule is using, uh, use small words, simplicity. Uh, the simpler the idea, the more understandable the idea is. Yes, okay. So uh, I just remember in one of the sentences they said that n not every american is going to pull out a dictionary and look up a word for you like <laughs> figure out what you're trying to say so i think keeping it simple is definitely better for a majority of people and your message just gets across that much easier to more people so. yeah definitely i would agree with everything you guys said uh john all right so for me uh, my last question is on rule number seven which is about speaking aspirationally and so really the First sentence is kind of what impacted me the most is it says messages need to say what people want to hear like i know it goes in and talks about politicians and how they use that but do you think anyone else uses it other than politicians what was the rule again i'm sorry oh aspirational speaking yeah, yeah I, I would say i would say many people use it more than politicians especially i see it a lot in my hockey coaches they, they need to be, uh, they need to use that type of language to inspire their players to do better or uh, keep them going in hard times throughout the season or something like that. That's what I can relate that back to. I think inspirational language is, is used everywhere. I mean, our professors use it all the time, I feel like, to just encourage us um, for what our, the future holds and um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Cause I mean, especially with the whole pandemic that we're in, you got to look at things with like a glass half full kind of aspect because you got to think that way in order to actually see that becoming an actual outcome. Instead of thinking it's going to be bad no matter what, you just got to come over. Maddie. Okay. Um, so apart from last week's reading called Outline Your Content, and apart from this week's reading, provide context and explain relevance are both important regarding steps to achieving your main goal. For these parts in the readings, what are some things that you have learned? Add context and relevance is what you said? Yeah. I would say that's pretty, that's probably one of the most important things to do. Because uh, if you don't have context, then it's what you're saying isn't going to be relevant. And if you're talking about something relevant, but you don't have context, it's like a back and forth between the two. So you need both, obviously, for either one to work. So it's kind okay. of a kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and my opinion on that is that like you, context is kind of what makes a speech a speech. Like you can hit your all your main points, but if you just say your main points and don't say why they're your main points, then people really won't connect with you as well. So if you build up a little bit of context behind those main points and explain to people, they could see it through sort of your opinion and your eyes, which I think helps out a lot in speech. Right. That's, yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. Awesome. Sweet, guys. Um, that was awesome. I liked uh, being able to talk to some of my classmates. Um, I hope you guys have a good rest of your weekend. Thank you. Well. You too.